Thank you very much. It's great to be here with you today. Uh, we're really excited uh, to present this project to you. And as was said a number of times, we hope uh, this is not uh, the end of something, but the beginning of something. I want to recognize our partners again uh, to begin. Our tree people, thank you so much for collaborating with us and bringing us into work with you on this project. We've really enjoyed the experience. Uh, Dr. Romolini, Eric, it's great to work with you again as a partner. Uh, Jolliffe, University of Vermont, and Dr. Locke is with a uh, research institution, but he worked with us on this project as an independent consultant because his expertise was really important to what we were trying to accomplish here. Again, I want to recognize the, the funding uh, agencies. The funding for the project came from the U.S. Forest Service, administered by CAL FIRE, and I want to note, too, that uh, the, the opinions and recommendations that we are offering today are those of the project team and not of the funding entities. So what? We showed you a lot of stuff. Uh, it might have been fun. It might have been interesting. What does that get us? That's always the fundamental question. So we're looking at a very large geography with uh, variable tree canopy ac across the study area. And communities we work with, we recommend reassessing every five to 10 years to try to keep up with change because change does occur over time. It's very complicated because as we said, we've got this very large geography, but management decisions are made at a very fine scale individually. So you've got this kind of aggregated effect. And unless you can try to get everybody to act in some kind of cohesive fashion, it's really hard to achieve the desired outcomes. One of the things we've seen over time with tree canopy is tree canopy loss is usually an event. Tree canopy gain is a process, and gain is a very long process. So when you have development, when you have fire, when you have storms, you can lose very significant amount of canopy very suddenly, but the growth takes time. And we know from much of the research that was done uh, here at the Pacific Northwest Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service that the bigger the tree canopy that you have, the more ecosystem services it provides. So it's much more beneficial to keep the trees that you have now than to let them be cut down and plant new trees that will take a significant amount of time to get that benefit. So we talked with tree people about tree preservation and we're gonna talk for the next few minutes about uh, regulatory tree preservation. There is of course voluntary tree preservation and we want to encourage people to manage the trees on their property and keep those trees. And we're very thankful that there are organizations like Tree People that encourage people to do that. Uh, there are all different kinds of tree ordinances and they all have different triggers. Uh, some of them apply to all trees, some just to public, some just to private. Some, uh, the trigger is a size of tree that gets an action taken on it. That can be the diameter of the tree at breast height, four and a half feet above ground level or in some cases it's the circumference of the tree. It's really easier for most people to measure circumference because they don't need a specialized tape to do that. Washington DC has a circumference measurement. Some have a special status. A tree is designated as something special. It's a, it's a heritage tree, it's a specimen tree. It has some other category that makes it protected. Uh, there may be an activity like development. It may be if you want to remove a tree for any reason. Sometimes even if you want to prune a tree on private property in some jurisdictions, you need to get a permit for that. And these things are not mutually exclusive. Sometimes they act in concert with each other. I just put together a quick slide comparing the city and county, some highlights of uh, the tree preservation ordinances there, uh, what ownerships they apply to, what size of trees. Uh, the status in both cases is a protected tree in the city. It's an oak plus certain other uh, species of tree in the county, it's oaks. Uh, there are different activities that are triggers uh, for the protection and then you know the mitigation is also a little bit different in each scenario as well. There is an ANSI standard for tree preservation during development. Uh, ANSI is the American National Standards Institute. ANSI creates standards for many types of goods and services, probably all the doors and light fixtures and other Appurtenances in this room have ANSI standards related to how they are built. Uh, there are ANSI standards for tree care practices, and uh, this is the highlights of the tree preservation standard. 
basically says you have an existing condition map that talks about the tree resources on the site and then the development is put onto that and you have a tree preservation plan showing what impacts are going to occur and how you're going to mitigate those impacts. So this is just an example from a, a project we work on. Uh, Maryland is the only state in the country that has a statewide forest uh, tree preservation law during development. And so you've got to have a map, an environmental features map that shows all the forest stands on site and talks about them and classifies them. Then there's a calculation you have to go through based on the size of the tract and how much forest cover exists on the tract and what the land use and zoning is. And you go through a calculation and you come to a break even point. If you exceed it, you've got to do afforestation or reforestation. Uh, in this particular jurisdiction, it's specimen trees are protected. So it's trees 30 inches in diameter or greater. So you've got to have a specimen tree table. There are an awful lot of specimen trees on this particular site, a few hundred of them. And those have to be mapped with the forest. And then the limit of disturbance is put on the plans. And if the encroachment is too much, the tree has to be removed. If not, the tree is going to be preserved. And stress reduction measures for preserved trees are called out on the plans. Some jurisdictions do it a little differently. In Washington, DC, the trigger is the size of the tree. If a tree is 44 to 100 inches in circumference, it's a special tree and it's protected, but it may be removed and mitigated. If it's 100 inches in circumference or bigger, it's a heritage tree, it cannot be removed. So uh, this street tree was a heritage tree. You gotta move the limited disturbance around it. You have to live with it. There are trees all along this border here, but they were not special, so they were all removed. These trees were special trees. These two were saved. This one had to be removed, so we inventory them, we perform risk assessments on them, uh, we recommend risk mitigation, and if we can treat the trees and reduce risk, the trees can be preserved. This tree couldn't be preserved, it was removed. So uh, different processes depending on how your ordinance works. We talked about how many trees should there be on an acre when we talked about some of these big areas of uh, landscape. And it's highly variable. The bottom line about reforestation and afforestation is if you've got a compliance requirement, you need to perform to it. If you don't have a compliance requirement and you're looking for technical assistance, here you'd want to go to your state forestry agency and go to CAL FIRE and say, what's the best practice I should use for reforestation in this particular location? In urban planting, it's a little bit different than reforestation and afforestation. Uh, how many trees should there be for acre in Maryland? It's basically 200 cross-sectional inches in uh, Northern Virginia. They look at the size of the tree stock and the species of tree and how much canopy it's going to get over a 10-year period, and they give you an amount of credit. And so you have to go through this planning process of designing your planting, see what size stock you're going to use, and then see how much canopy you're going to get. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay Urban Tree Canopy Expert Panel, we came up with 300 trees per acre. We used iTree to come up with that. Uh, based on a two-year growth planning. The bottom line is this is kind of all over the place. When you're mitigating for tree removal, there are four basic practices. You can either plant trees back on site, you can plant off site, you can uh, pay a fee in lieu payment. It may be by number of acres or number of inches, uh, things like that. And then in some locations, they have mitigation bank purchases where somebody takes a blank piece of land, plants trees on it, and then sells credits on a per acre basis when development projects need to mitigate and they can't do it on site. So there are a lot of options for mitigation also, and this is very helpful. Uh, it has been helpful in our experience in making the tree preservation not be considered a taking constitutionally because you have many ways to comply. So next steps, uh, and this is where we get to the part of the program where we want to talk about the so what what additional analysis would be useful? How do we operationalize these data? Uh, we talked about differences across the city and county. There are 88 municipalities in the county. So without, if there's no consistency and we realize home rule, you're not gonna get homogeneity, but if there are not broad agreements as to what you're trying to accomplish with tree preservation among all these actors, it will really be hard to achieve landscape scale tree canopy goals? Should there be some type of regional consortium that works on these issues? Market segmentation outreach strategy. Uh, the, the purpose of the market segmentation data was not to create class war. Uh, Dr. Locke has done some great research on 
markets, messages, and messengers. Different market segments receive messages differently from different types of messages and messengers. So we'd want to tailor those approaches to who you're trying to engage so you can communicate efficiently and effectively. In some of those places, you'd be looking for people to urge them to preserve their tree canopy. In some of those market segments, you'd be wanting to encourage people to accept new trees and plant them on their property. Dr. Romolini has worked on a project called StuMap. StuMap has been done in many cities across the U.S. And there, there is a Los Angeles StuMap. It's basically a network map of the organizations in the region that are involved in natural resources stewardship. This is kind of a tool you could use to kind of activate this network to look at some of these other goals you want to accomplish. And finally, uh, to advocate for urban forest inventory and an analysis for Los Angeles. Is that something you'd be interested in? You may or may not know the Forest Service has collected a census of the nation's trees since the 30s. In 2014, that census moved into the city, but it's being done on a phased uh, basis. So right now, I believe in California, the only city that is on the schedule for urban FIA is San Diego. Uh, the way this, these data are collected is plots are set out, and those plots data are collected on is whether they have trees, if they do have trees, what type of trees, and it's an ongoing census over time. So just like we get the top-down information on tree canopy, which is quantitative, this will give you qualitative information on Los Angeles urban forests, and as the data collection goes from the initiation forward, you have change detection over time, so you have information on how trees on the ground are changing over time. So uh, some ideas. We'd love to hear your thoughts on these and any other thoughts that you jotted down as we presented today. Thanks very much for the opportunity to be with you today. So let's go ahead and take a couple of questions specific to Mike's presentation, and then the rest of our time will really be about diving into discussion. Great. Thank you. Bonnie Benson, uh, UCLA. And uh, the on the tree replacement sort of strategy, a couple slides back. Yes. Is it, is there any sort of detail about the, the size of tree they have to replace? So if they tear down, a, if they cut down a, you know, a certain caliber, then that they have to replace with that caliber, or is it just great, well, find a tree? Well, well, well those goes into the, into the mitigation. Okay. So in, in different jurisdictions, uh, you know, some, some places will take the appraised value of that tree because you want to account for the value that you can't buy in the marketplace, but that has been an investment over time. Some do it as an equivalent number of cross-sectional inches. Okay. So it really varies by jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it would, it's, a, it's a great conversation to say, what do we want to accomplish by that? Some jurisdictions say we refuse to take fee in lieu. I can talk to you a lot about uh, fee in lieu and how once you have a tree preservation ordinance, what we saw in uh, the, the places in the east that I work in, in the mid-Atlantic, a lot of, once the Forest Conservation Act was passed, a lot of public agencies began to hoard their own land because they said, if we build in the future, we're gonna need some place to plant, so we're not gonna let anybody else mitigate on our land, and everybody began locking their land up, and so what happened is public agencies took fee and lieu, they grew these huge war chests of funds that they couldn't plant anywhere. So, yeah, the, the laws of perverse outcomes, so you have to think about those things as you work through this. Are there any of the tree preservation ordinances that you've worked with that have a tree canopy goal? Because what I have seen, and I think all of us have, is that you remove a mature canopy and you don't have the return of that canopy for many years. So to kind of have a, a higher goal than just break even, have you seen any of the legislation put forward that has that in it? I think that would be really helpful for us to look at and to demand. Th so there's a, uh, oh, could I?
Let, let me, if I could, in, in Northern Virginia, uh, a couple of jurisdictions, and, and they're a little bit different, but they'll have you map the canopy on site at the time of development, the existing conditions map. You don't get any credit for overhang. So if my neighbor has a tree proximate to the property line and half their crown is on my property, I don't get credit for that. I only get credit for the stems that exist on my land. So that canopy is accounted for. Uh, based on these, the, the land use and zoning of the lot, there is a percentage canopy target that has to be achieved. So you look at that target and then you look at what you have and you look at what you're gonna remove. Uh, then you've gotta go through the mitigation sequence and the, the credit is variable depending on whether or not it's native, uh, whether or not it's, even if it's native but it's been invaded and the invasives haven't been controlled, you get reduced credit and there are things like that in there. Then after you've gotta do this planting plan and again based on each species of tree has a 10 year canopy credit that they assign it and it's just a, it's, it's, it's in a table. So it's not, look at what I'm buying. It's, you look up in the table and you're going, if I plant a one inch red maple, I get this much credit. If I plant a two inch this much, a three inch this much. And you've got to keep planting until you break that threshold of the mitigation requirement that you have. We have one more question back here about Mike's presentation. Hi, this is India Brookover from Southern California Association of Governments. Um, my question is, what kind of policies or best practices or strategies are there for um, preserving existing mature trees that might have an impact on infrastructure, like sidewalks, and sort of balancing those two issues? Well, I mean, there are, there are, a, lot of, uh, there are a lot of best practices, and, and we were speaking this morning about, about soil, uh, sometimes one of the things, if you have a really big tree and you put it in a really small hole, you're gonna have problems. So uh, that's kind of, uh, and th there's been research done that shows the, you know, the, the, the closer the stem is to the infrastructure, the greater the probability of a conflict with that infrastructure, which is usually heaving. So, uh, you know, one of the things is to look at your standards and specifications and to see what are the requirements for soil prep, what are the requirements for minimum, uh, pit size and things like that now, realizing that, uh, you know, of course in cities and we work in all kinds of cities and, uh, you know, if you, if you had to wait till there was an ideal situation everywhere to put a tree in, in many cities, there wouldn't be any. So it's often to do, uh, not to do the best you can, but do the least bad you can. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the, there are things like root pruning and root barriers and different things you can try to do. There are, pr uh, uh, Items like flexi pave that you can use. It's a, 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 a flexible pavement surface that you can use that will uh, kind of roll, uh, but you can still use it for ADA and things like that. So uh, it's, it's all about looking at the, uh, it's, it's really more of a BMP question, I think, but you may have an option in your, uh, in your best practices to address those. And we have a quick follow-up comment on Mike's response. Hi, I'm Pavitra Ramohan. I'm with Deep Root, and uh, our flagship product, Silver Cells, is one of the practices, technology that we use, where we direct those roots. You know, one of the challenges why the roots come up to the concrete surface is they don't get what they want, the nutrients, the water, the soils. So when you have a barrier like that that guides it into an underground system that can hold the lightly compacted soils, even under paved surfaces, then the chances that they come back up is gonna be limited because you're gonna avoid the situation of a cold joint where you have roots growing on top of those silver cells. So that's a way where you take it in and once they are in, they just grow uh, within those pods you know, of lightly compacted soils. So just wanted to add that thought. Yeah, I would say they were, they were actually, and also root barriers, mm -hmm. but the silver cells, the idea is in most places you, you uh, you need surface treatment because people need to drive vehicles and walk and, and all those things. So uh, a, a product like Silver Cells, and there are others like it, can uh, it will meet the load bearing requirements, but you can put a surface treatment on it so that it's not just compacted soil underneath and roots can grow, but you can still have the surface treatment for vehicular and pedestrian traffic on top. So thanks. Great. The thanks very discussion much. is already <laughs> beginning. So. Uh, Thank you, Mike.
Um, we're going to project a few more questions just to plant the seed for discussion.